Um, All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Niyam Yaragi, and I'm a fellow at the Brookings Center for Technology Innovation, where I primarily work on health information technology and different aspects of it. And as we all know, patient privacy is an instrumental aspect of health information technology. Uh, here we have a panel to talk about patient privacy and their rights when it comes to the digital age where uh, health information is being exchanged through various technologies and formats. And uh, uh, I'm very pleased to have uh, such a nice uh, panel here. Uh, on my left, I have Craig, who is a professor of, uh, who is a lecturer of law uh, in, uh, in the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Then I have uh, Randy, uh, Randy Farmer, who is uh, the CEO of Delaware Health Information Network, which is the regional health information organization of Delaware. And then uh, I have uh, Catherine, who is the chairman of the Patient Doctor Medical Association. She is, uh, <laughs> did, I, did I say it wrong? Doctor Patient Medical Association, though patients should be first. Yes. You're absolutely so, correct. Uh, <laughs> and uh, she is, uh, she's an old friend of uh, the summit. She has been here since the very beginning. And the last but not least, we have uh, Herde, who is the CEO and co-founder of Zipdi Health, which is uh, another HIE, but uh, it's a patient-mediated health information exchange network. So, uh, as you can see, we have uh, people with various backgrounds and expertise, uh, and I would like to ask uh, uh, Herde to start the uh, panel discussion with a short presentation that he has on uh, what ZipD Health is doing and how uh, specifically uh, their approach to information exchange puts patients first and helps with protecting their privacy. Well, thanks, Niam. So, uh, once again, thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Niam, are you going to run it? Yes. Okay, yes. Perfect. So this slide deck was done, I think, last Friday, Saturday, before this morning's, you know, before I heard all the comments from this morning. And you'll see a lot. You could, sorry, you could change the slide yourself. Oh, perfect. <laughs> so I'll start with this as a patient to providers, payers, and everyone else who's aggregating patient data. Please leave my data alone. That's a request I want to start with because I think if given chance, if given the right data and right format, most people will handle it and they can manage it. Outside US, about 6.7, 6.5 billion people already are doing it. So that it's not rocket science. And yes, I do know that analytics are good for you, not for the patient. Because if we do it, every time it's about the patient that if we can run the data analytics, it's good for the patient, very rarely. That's true. So <clears throat> data mining is only good so much. As a patient, let me decide what we want to share, who we want to share with, how much, and for how long. So that's, that's the basic principle from where we start building ZipD Health. So what we are trying to get to is to have patients same level of access as HIEs now. So we are creating, trying to create this HIE, which is patient-mediated or your caregiver mediated. So you'll have a full control. If you have the same level of access to the same level of data, you can control it much better than any HIE. To give you an example, there are so many issues which are there with the HIEs run by state or different organizations where they can't even match your ID. My name, with my current provider, it's Hirde Batal. First name, last name. But my full Indian name is Hirde Paul Singh Bhattal. That's what Kaiser used years ago. So they cannot even match those two names and bring it as one person. In San Diego, where I live, they started using a company here, local company in Virginia, and their software called Carbon. What Carbon does is it takes all my data in healthcare, 
without asking me. So HIE is giving it to them, and my providers are giving it to HIE, and then connect that data to my social profiles, whether it's LinkedIn, Facebook, Yahoo accounts. So imagine this thing, all the conversation we had this, this morning. So they are taking my private health information, connecting the dots with my social profiles, and then fi figuring out that here are they, Buttel, and here are they, Paul Singh Buttel is the same person. And this is their press release, their own press release. I'm, I'm happy to share that with you. And they did this, this thing without ever asking for permission or telling me. So that's why having same level of access and let the patient determine the level of you know, how, how they want to uh, share the data, that's important. And also make HIEs, which are already holding patient data, accountable to the patient. That's also, I think, one of the big things, because they have our data, but they are accountable only to the providers, maybe to the payers, not to us. For some reason, it's been passed over. So the way forward, this is something I think Adrian, is Adrian here? Been pushing for a while to have HIE of one, you know, so the person or the patient controls the HIE. You as a consumer are in control. Create a smart HIE. This was a question I think somebody asked me this afternoon. Why you think a patient control HIE can be successful and Google Health failed and Microsoft Wall failed and all those things. If we make that HIE as a smart HIE, which means patient is now getting some benefit out of it rather than just having a dumb tube moving data from A to point B. That's what HIEs are today. They're moving data from one hospital to another, but there's not, that data can be used to create information, create something good for the patient, help patient. You know, there was a reference just a few minutes ago about the reminders for the medications. Whether it's reminders for the medication, or any other flag we want to look at, but it should be for the patient. And so think about this thing. This is going away from big data to small data. One person for the one person here. This is exactly opposite what we've talked this morning. And then the last thing, making that access is so important. We use ATM card or credit card around the world without even thinking about it. We access our bank account. Why can't health? Care providers do that. There's a ways to do it. We have done it you know, technically, but it's again, we have still need a connection to the servers with the healthcare provider, which, which is the next hurdle for us. But uh, that's where we are. So, Niam, that's, uh, I think that's the last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, would you like to? Uh, can we go in the order that's in the program? Okay. Uh, what is the next order in the program? Randy? Randy. Randy, okay. It makes it makes uh, a nice contrast because what Zipti is uh, is proposing is uh, one of the three approaches to health information exchange, which is patients are given full control of their data, just like uh, you having control of your bank account through an through a mobile app on your cell phone, and you can send money and receive money to and from other people uh, as, as long as you have their bank account number, uh, you can send and receive medical records to uh, many different people from caregivers to medical providers to, uh, to your family members. And uh, also one of, the, one of the other good things about it is you would be able to check the accuracy of those medical records and make sure that there is no error in them. Uh, one of the other approaches to health information exchange is to have a central or federated database in which all the uh, creators of data, which are medical providers, labs, and imaging centers, uh, and physicians upload the medical records that they create for the patient to this uh, databases and then those who have required uh, uh, authorizations and authentications can download the medical records of those patients whom they are treating. And uh, 
uh, Randy can talk uh, about that approach and uh, how Delaware Health Information Network, which is one of the few very successful uh, regional health organizations in the nation, uh, talk about uh, uh, their organization and how they are how they are helping patients to manage their privacy. Yeah. Uh, th th uh, thank you uh, uh, very much for uh, having me again uh, here this year. This is my third year for uh, joining the Patient Privacy Rights uh, Summit. And the uh, previous years, I've chatted a little bit about like the, the, this issue and, and the uh, opportunity uh, that we have as a robust health information exchange to better connect patients with, with the information in our network. By way of background, just in case some of those folks that are here may not be aware, uh, Delaware launched the um, first statewide HIE in the country back in May of uh, 2007. Uh, our roots go back to legislation that was signed back in 1997. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a point of pride uh, for the healthcare uh, system in the state that, uh, that there was a great deal of vision and a great deal of uh, uh, interest in leveraging um, uh, technology in order to provide for a healthier uh, healthcare ecosystem. Uh, our statute uh, stipulates that we are not only to just provide uh, a system to support providers and, and, and uh, caregivers, but also insurance companies and patients, uh, specifically in the area of making things more efficient for the betterment of the common good. Um, if we can provide efficiencies that bring down cost and reduce uh, the, the cost to insurance companies, then we are fulfilling our charge. When we better engage patients with their information in our network, so that they can have an even more informed uh, perspective and have the ability to access their information, we are fulfilling our charge. I will tell you that in uh, our nine years since we launched, we, we, we've done a pretty good job of the, of the provider piece. And we're getting to the point where I think that we have, we're on the precipice of closing the gap and providing some meaningful tools and resources on those, on, uh, specifically on the, on the consumer uh, uh, side of things. Um, and, and even to a degree with, with regards to providing more services to the payers, although uh, that's uh, probably another topic for another session. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the patients, we did a very robust um, consumer research project when I first started with the organization uh, back in 2012. We uh, did a quantitative and qualitative research study through Ipsos Vanis, a, uh, a, a professional market research firm. And basically, uh, you know, doing the focus groups and through the quantitative surveys, uh, realized that there were two primary themes that we, that we garnered out of, out of the consumers. Number one, you know, big data is, is a little scary. Uh, I care about my, my privacy. I care about the safety of my information. But boy, if you guys can check the box on those two things, and you're going to be able to have, uh, provide access to information when somebody I care about is in the emergency room, or you're going to make it easier for me to care about uh, my elderly parents or my son or daughter with a chronic condition, this is a godsend. This provides me with peace of mind. I mean, those are the two primary themes. So we figured, like, all right, we, we've got a good thing here, but a lot of folks don't really know where we are in terms of, like, the background. There is a system that, that the providers have adopted, I mean, um, that is being used robustly. Uh, all of our hospitals participate, labs, major labs, radiology firms send data through our network. And we have close to 100% participation of, of doctors who provide orders in the state. And we have connections with Maryland's HIE and even uh, with the uh, District of Columbia's uh, hospitals, where they are sending um, uh, admission discharge transfer summaries for any uh, Delaware resident that is treated at a DC hospital. And we're doing the same for them. So, you know, healthcare knows no borders. Um, and I can tell you that uh, the other thing I will share with you is, is sometimes like, well, Delaware, it's, it's uh, yeah, three counties of awesome. Okay, big deal. Um, uh, you know, but we actually have like over 2.2 million patients, unique patients in our, in our, in our, in our catalog. And that's uh, over 100% of the, of the state's population. And it goes to the point of like healthcare knows no borders. Our largest hospital system, uh, Christiana Care, um, and this is a, a data point that's st uh, stuck with me from July, I think it was 2015. In a three-week period, uh, they treated um, patients from 24 different states in July of 2015. And they also happened to have the second largest uh, trauma center on the East Coast. Uh, their privacy officer's here, and she's not nodding no, so I, gotta, I think I'm, I'm okay there. Uh, I'm pretty sure about that. 
Um, so again, healthcare knows no borders, and the more that we can provide access to the information, the better. So we sought off in, on developing a tool that was going to provide greater transparency, and I'm thrilled to announce that, number one, we, have, we, um, we, we are in the process of launching uh, this tool that's going to provide for greater transparency uh, for patients. I mean, patients have always been able to, to get access to their information through our network, but it's a very 1980s process um, where you show up at our office during normal business hours or uh, send us a notarized uh, request. So we needed to do better with that in terms of, in terms of uh, enabling folks with access to, the, to, to their data. Um, now, I will tell you that all of our uh, participating organizations are required to disclose participation in the network. It is, and again, we've been set up by statute through our state legislature, so just so that you understand uh, that dynamic. But uh, in order to better enable and empower patients, we've, we wanted to make sure that they had a line of sight in terms of, number one, who's looking at their information on our network, and number two, when they, um, to, for them to get an alert uh, have the capacity to receive an alert anytime a new record is is um, entered into their catalog. So what we're doing is we're working with this a company called Impulse, and they are very well known in the um, in in the in the healthcare realm and uh, in applying HIPAA compliant uh, encrypted standards to electronic communication. And um, so what we're going to do is we're going to launch a product that will provide text message alerts to patients so that, let's say, my wife goes for a mammogram and she's waiting for the results on pins and needles. As you can see in this uh, example, uh, that she would receive an alert. Your doctor has received your results. There'll be a link, uh, a hyperlink to the practice uh, that will be noted in, um, in, in the particular alert and so that the, they can click on that and get the details to confirm that that is, in fact, the practice that they went to in order to have the results done. So provide some words of assurance that Hey, if you're waiting for the result, the result has been delivered to the provider through our network, and you should be hearing something from them soon. So that if you don't hear something in one to two days, go ahead and, you know, give them a call. That's the implicit message there. But what about a situation where um, your case has been um, referred to a, clin a clinician, a specialist? And maybe it's on your radar, maybe it's not. But you get an alert in a case where... Um, uh, that of a, of a, of a uh, viewing of your record where you don't necessarily recognize that practice or you don't recognize uh, that particular provider or that information. You can click on the alert to get more information and then we uh, ask you to confirm whether or not you recognize that. If you say no, then we send you back information and, and some uh, direction. Go ahead and contact that uh, provider. You can click right on the above uh, hyperlink right on your smartphone. It'll take you right to their, to their business, and you can talk to them about what it is that they're doing, why they're, why they're looking at your, why they're, uh, at, at your medical information. And then if you're not satisfied with that, we have a link to a page that will provide more direction in terms of your options and other things that you can do if you have concerns that your privacy has been violated. So that's hopefully going to provide that much greater transparency, those, that level of security. More often than not, this is probably a legitimate um, uh, uh, search for patient information. Um, but I can tell you what we're excited about that is if there, if there are folks that may be thinking about using the system for, for things other than clinical uses, this type of service will be one of those things that will help them think twice about that, along with, the, obviously, the, the legal penalties. Another scenario has to do with when uh, you are um, admitted to a hospital or emergency room. And who needs an alert when you're admitted to a, an emergency room or to a hospital? Well, I don't know if I need that alert. If either I'm incapacitated or I already know I'm there. But in a case where it's somebody who's misrepresenting themselves and they're using your insurance information, mm -hmm. it would be a good thing for, for you to get that alert so that if you reply no, we can send that alert to, let's say, that uh, paying organization and also give you direction in terms of what you can do in this case to understand what, what has transpired and why somebody is showing up at the hospital is the, uh, with, with your, may possibly your insurance information. Now, it could be a clerical error. In which case, if that's the case, we would have cleared up a real mess that could have had a patient safety uh, uh, component to it, 
or a uh, paying issue with it or uh, the, the bureaucratic issue uh, that may have resulted from it. Instead, we're, we're catching it at, at the beginning or helping to catch it at the beginning. Um, if it's the worst case scenario where somebody's misrepresenting themselves, we're helping to identify that issue right away and even before the person may have even left the hospital, allow the proper uh, authorities to go ahead and investigate and determine what has transpired and to save you know, the healthcare system paying uh, money that it should not have paid and helping the uh, patient from enduring uh, the complications of having a result hit their catalog that was not theirs, which is, again, a patient safety issue. In this case, this, th there would be an alert sent to the insurance company as well so that they could start investigating. Lastly, I mean, in general, I, if, if let's say we're just doing this without a, necessarily a tie to insurance company, uh, it's, it's, we, we look at this as launching to a general consumer population and they would receive a similar alert driving them to a web page um, where they can get more information. Um, we are applying for a patent, so all of our materials will have patent pending on our, on our uh, designated marketing, marketing materials. We're very excited about this because we think that this could be a unique opportunity here to one, provide transparency, deeper engage patients with health healthcare, with their healthcare, as that is a key component to bringing down the cost of healthcare, as well as helping to identify fra fraud, waste, and abuse in the healthcare system. And it's funny, in the, in the last session or earlier session, it occurred to me that um, one of the other things we can do here, and it's important to me and everybody in our organization, in the spirit of transparency, is, is that we provide some sort of a high level disclosure in terms of any of the terms and conditions, kind of like a Schumer box, but for privacy. And so I look forward to getting some counsel from some of the folks here in terms of what that might entail so that we could make it, it as easy as possible for folks that are enrolling in this service to understand what it does, what it doesn't do, and uh, what options that they have when, when, they, when they participate in, the, in these types of services. So that, that's my story. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Randy. This is, this is a great example of how technology, if done right, could uh, help protect privacy rather than uh, exposing patients' uh, personal information. Uh, in the old days where it was all paper records, uh, if anybody looked at my charts, uh, I had no way of uh, knowing that. But now that everything is electronic, uh, with the use of the technologies that you just uh, uh, observed, uh, and at least as a patient, I would know that who accessed my records. Uh, thank you very much, Randy. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. And I think it's your turn, Catherine. Okay. Well, I feel a little bit like Goldilocks. Um, an HIE of one, a public exchange um, with, through a state, and I'm going to talk about a private exchange kind of in the middle. So I think what's interesting is that we're seeing all these different models coming up and in ways that I don't know that we really expected um, the exchanges to, to move this direction. Would you like to load your... I'm under documents. Privacy Summit CIRCS. Okay. So I am, I am as, as you said, I am chair and found, co-founder of the Doctor Patient Medical Association. And yes, patients should come first, but the rhythm was such that it worked better <laughs> to have doctors <laughs> first. Um, and one of the things that we are most engaged in is is uh, is aiding and increasing the communication between patients and medical professionals, not just doctors, but all medical professionals. So we, and in that, we have been very strong privacy advocates um, and involved, as, as we said, and with the uh, Privacy Summit and PPR for a long time. Um, one of our projects is Keep Your Doctor. Um, we are, we've been working very hard to help doctors who are in independent practices stay in independent practices instead of seeing monolithic um, hospital-based practices or, or huge, multi, very big system practices. Um, not that they shouldn't 
be around, but that there are many physicians who prefer to work, still work independently. So what we're looking at ways of empowering doctors and other professionals and how they can have all of the tools um, as independent physicians that they would have if they were in a big system. So that's kind of our, our overall. Um, I, I want to turn the question around. We're talking, the, the, the panel is, um, with the growth of health information exchanges, can, what rights do patients have? I want to flip the question around. It's how can we protect patient privacy and get in, useful information from exchanges? That's what I, I'm trying to look at. Um, you, you know, we, we moving on beyond just moving the information back and forth for clinical use or for billing purposes. Um, now what we're doing is in crunching a little bit of it um, and, oh yeah, uh, do the minimum to protect patient privacy. And that's kind of the model that many exchanges have taken with present company excluded. So another, I want to look at also, who benefits from the, from the exchange and how it works? Because what we usually hear is that it's beneficial for the clinical information, for the doctors, for public health people. Um, but what I want to look at is, and researchers in the public health community. We've talked a lot over the years about the disparity between public health and, and the actual individual patient and using this information for individual patients. So how are we going to do this for patients and frontline professionals? And use Because that, that's really what you're talking about, too, mm -hmm. is trying to find ways to make it useful to the patients instead of just um, f for the people who are running it. And I have to tell you, I've changed my mind on this a little bit. Um, I am known as one of the sort of knuckle-dragging Neanderthal privacy advocates who has been really had to be convinced on some of the electronic um, approaches. Not that I oppose them, but that the issue of privacy has been so prim primary to us. Um, but there's something that happened um, recently that changed my mind. This is my dog, Penelope. This is the moose. Oh, and this is in Alaska. I had a one-day meeting up in Alaska, and... Um, Instead of sitting in the airport waiting for my flight, I decided to go get some exercise. So, um, and I always take my dog with me. And did I mention rollerblades? So between the dog, when you add Penelope and the moose together, you get a visit to the ER. Wow. So that's me in being taken into Anchorage. So I had an experience um, in an ER for the first time since I was a child. I also... It's the first time that I have used insurance as an adult. And I ain't young. But I have, because I've been working with physicians, I have been a cash-paying patient all of my adult life. I'm very fortunate, I have, I, but I have had some health um, episodes, but I have worked that out. Um, and people don't believe me, but I always pay cash for my prescriptions, and I'm still paying cash for my prescriptions because I want to keep them out of my insurance record. Um, I use do I've used doctors in the past who don't use electronic records at all, and I am one of those curmudgeons that refuses to sign the HIPAA advisory at the drugstore just because I refuse to, to do it um, because I know it's worthless. So <laughs> that, that gives you some idea of where I'm coming from as I talk about this. So... I, having now been through my insurance at the University of Washington Medical Center in Seattle at Harborview, and they are using eCare. They were one of the early adopters on eCare. Um, and I have to say, I love it. And I almost feel bad, uh, badly saying that. I feel guilty saying that. I love it. I love it that I can set up an appointment. I love it that I can look at my real-time lab results. I can see the x-ray as soon as it's posted, as they send it to, to the doctor, and I get it at the same time. I love all this stuff. I can communicate. I get to see their clinical notes. I love it. Um, and, and, and do I like the fact that eCare is a product of Experian? Eh, not so much. That, that frightens me a little bit. Um, but, 
you know, it's been about my broken ankle, so maybe I don't care about the information they have. Remember, I still do my prescriptions cash and not, not in my insurance. So I keep, I'm withholding information yet. But given that, that I actually like this now, we ought to figure out, um, the question for me is, am I getting any benefit out of this as a patient other than the convenience of being able to look at stuff? Is that really helping me? Is that helping my, advance my health or keep me well or help me heal more quickly or aid in my rehab work, et cetera? So what I'm going to do is take a quick look at a group in New Jersey that I think is doing it right. And it's an independent physician organization, an IPO owned and operated by physicians. Um, again, there's doctors who want to stay in independent practice. Um, so this New Jersey group is called Osler, and they have a platform called MD Click that's, that is complete interoperability, not just to the insurance companies, but between the offices. They have complete, in, that's, now that's key, complete interoperability between Dr. A and Dr. B without having to go get, retrieve it from somewhere. And that's kind of their secret sauce right now. Um, but, you know, again, we're looking at the two kinds of population health because that's what we're getting to is population health. Um, the confusion is looking at the two types of population health. To public health officials... You know, the population health identifies public health threats like disease outbreak and so on. But to physicians, public health, pop, population health, along with analytics, identifies the patients at risk of developing chronic diseases or added complications or who need to get closer attention. So again, it's about the individual patient. Um, we use the public exchanges much more for who was admitted, as you talked about, who was admitted and who was discharged, um, then admitted through the ER or through the hospitals, um, to be sure nothing is missed, and those safety valves like you just talked about. Um, public exchanges serve the interests of the hospitals, and except that you do need to be sick um, for hospitals to, to have you cover their costs. Private exchanges, on the other hand, as you're talking about, even the private exchange of one, the private exchanges serve the interests of the patients who want to stay well. So this story is about this group of doctors who are doing this. Oh, I'm sorry, I've, I've, I've got so wrapped up. What I was talking about, I forgot that slide. Moving on, there we go. Um, it, their exchange is certainly smaller than a state or big public exchange. But even with the number of doctors that they have participating, they have ten, can have tens to hundreds of thousands of patients. And that translates into meaningful data. That's big enough to have meaningful data. And in the transition, of course, in paying for value instead of volume, um, creating higher quality patient satisfaction and outcomes is key. And the, the ability to gather that data from disparate sources into that common platform is really key to doing that. Um, and that's what they are doing. Again, that's what you would do if you were in a big system but most independent physicians haven't been able to do that. And remember, I told you that I pick doctors who are independent. So I'm the patient who would be example who hasn't been able to take advantage of some of the population health management tools. Um, the Osler patients, inform the information's complete. It's, it's secure. It's all the things that it meets all the tests that we'd look at in terms of the Consumer Bill of Rights on privacy and electronic information. Transparent, um, access and accuracy, security, respect for the contacts, individual control. Meets all of that stuff. And this is new. And wh whom to emulate or partner with is important to us not only to protect our privacy, but also our lives. So it, it starts to enter into our choices as consumers. There are two access points um, in their system. One is the doctors, and of course the patient authorizes it, and your personal access or the patient portal. So you can get in either way, and you're in control, as you've talked about, they're in control of your medical information with just a username and a password, um, and you can do appointments and all those things that I can do, can do with eCare. Um, but here's, here's the p part that, that we think that uh, is really key that I like 
what they're doing is that they use de-identified big data to identify the at-risk patients. Using predictive analytics, they identify ineffective, wasteful doctors. They identify the patient's needs by tracking behaviors as well and getting them help. Patient reminders to take prescriptions, reminders to the physician if the patient hasn't, fulf hasn't filled their prescription. So much of the behavioral aspect impacts our, the, the quality of care. And so this picks, picks up on that. Um, it uses a very, they're working on a patent as well, um, that uses a, a pretty sophisticated encryption to do this. So what they're doing is making the doctors partners in care so that the physicians, medical professionals, are getting the analytics, not just some researcher at a hospital or at a university. They're actually getting analytics to help help their individual patients. Um, it's very effective. I think we have to look at um, treating patients as people, not statistics now, um, and pro proactively providing superior care. It also helps identify the doctors. That only the best, better doctors are going to do well in these systems because we're tracking them. Um, so we are, know the doctors who are doing a better job. But there is a problem because we're also looking at some battle between who should be at the helm of this, with the even in, among the physicians. Um, in all cases where the physicians manage the information and patient control it, the right people are in charge. Sorry, but we we like the idea of the the private the private exchange. Um, the data and information serves its patients, to, is, should serve its safety, and the public safely, reliably, and privately through their doctors. Public HIEs serve the public through either corporations or public entities. Now, to summarize, and where we're at right now is, to close up, is we have all these models coming up. There are some that aren't so good. Of course, the ones you're hearing about today are all fabulous. Uh, but some aren't so good, and some, some are so, sort of stumbling along in meeting the privacy issue and in meeting the useful information issue. So the question is, how are we going to rate and identify the health information exchanges that are doing a, quote, good job? both protecting privacy and getting useful information, as well as doctor and patient satisfaction in using them. So I think one of the things that I like to come out of our meeting this year is work on what we can do to start to measure that and start to m not necessarily monitor, but rate or rank or do something in terms of measuring the satisfaction and effectiveness of the exchanges. So I hope that we will come out of this and and start to, fi to use this as an um, impetus to figure that out. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. So uh, we have uh, a lawyer here. And uh, 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 Craig, the, the question that I have is, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about privacy. This, this whole summit is about privacy. But, but how do you define privacy? Uh, what is privacy, and uh -huh. and what are some issues related to privacy when it comes uh, to to medicine? Um, so those are very big questions. I'm going to take a, a portion of the questions, and that's all I'll be able to talk about. I think. Um, so, so, so privacy. The way it's just, so there are many people who've spoken about privacy and written about privacy at length. Um, some of them in this room. Um, and the way I think about it is uh, is is, th is to think about. Uh, privacy is the control of information um, within uh, within certain contextual parameters, right? So you can imagine. So if I you know can look and see that you're wearing a certain kind of wardrobe, that doesn't interfere with your privacy because my access to that information doesn't interfere with the norms of this context. Um, but on the other hand, if I you know hack into your medical record, that certainly violates several norms, not to mention laws. So that is a privacy intrusion. So, um, so here I'm drawing upon um, Helen Nissenbaum, who is a professor at NYU, formerly of Princeton, who has written about privacy as what she calls contextual integrity. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the idea is that you um, access information within the norms of the context. So, um, so as it applies, I think, to um, health information exchanges and health information exchange as a verb more broadly across the economy, and sorry, I don't have slides, um, I think about privacy protections as falling into three main categories. Right, the first is accidental protections, um, what um, Helen has referred to as privacy as obscurity. Or um, I, 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 was, I saw a recent paper where uh, they referred to these kinds of protections as desirable inefficiency. 
right? Mm -hmm. So the idea that you, ca you can't access this information simply because the network um, is ju just not interoperable, um, you know, you, and, and so you, you can't go across various networks to bring the information together. Now that protects privacy. Uh, and so, so that's one kind of protection. You, you, you're not aiming for that protection, but you just have. Um, the second kind of protection is what I'll call objective protections. Uh, so these are protections that are put into place whether or not the patient wants it. So I'm thinking about protections, for example, in you know, the Part 2 regulations or certain kinds of HIPAA protections that whether or not the patient wants those protections, um, that th th their data is going to be protected in that way. And the third is what I'm going to call subjective protections, right? So the idea that um, patients can, um, can opt out of these protections. Now, these, of course, come with different layers, right? So you can think about broad consent um, versus opt-in versus opt-out. They, they give various levels of control to the patient, right? So, 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 so it can be fairly textured in that way. So the question is, as we get into this world of health information exchange, which of these three kinds of protections are we going to see um, uh, uh, surviving? Pull your microphone. Oh, okay, you sorry. Uh, which, which of these three protections are we going to see surviving? I don't know if this is, is it on? Okay, okay. So, um, so the, I think the entire purpose of health information exchange is to end accidental or obscurity-based protections. We don't want accidental protections. We want the data to be transferred as we intend for it to be transferred. So I think that that kind of protection is, you know, uh, basically undermines the very notion of health information exchange, though it has historically been probably the most important kind of privacy protection until date. So we're left with objective protections and subjective protections. And now I begin to think about the changing nature of U US law and US constitutional law specifically. Uh, so I think about the battles of protection, um, uh, the, the battles over data um, that, that we see happening. And we, we talk about, we've spoken at some length about um, about companies trying to access your data and to use the data for their purposes, and you know you trying to hold on to your data. The question is, in those battles, who's going to win? And what we've been seeing increasingly in the United States Supreme Court is that companies seem to be winning these battles. Now we have a seat open on the court. This may change, but basically under current law, my sense is that things don't look very good. So the two tensions uh, you see in, in, in constitutional law: one is battles over data as property. And so on one hand, you have patients claiming the data is theirs. It's my data, I believe you began by saying. But you have companies on the other side saying, well, actually, this is my data. It's, in fact, protected by IP law. It's protected by a bunch of other, uh, in, in certain contexts, IP law doesn't, doesn't um, really go that far. But, but you have companies on the other side claiming the data as their own. And if you look at state law across the country, I think many, many would say, I'm not one of the people who say this, but many would say that there's a better argument for the, uh, on the company side um, than the patient side. This is not what I'm saying should be the case. I'm just saying what is the case, right? So that's so that you've got these property battles. I'm also thinking about um, cases um, in the medical context where individuals have Henrietta Lacks is the classic example, but the foundational case here is Moore versus Regents of California, and you know Moore goes in and his um, and, and and his cells are used for research, and Moore says. You know, look, this is, these are my cells. It's my property. Uh, and, you know, and sues for what's called the tort of conversion. Um, and the court says, well, for that tort, you have to have an ownership interest. And it goes against public policy for you to have an ownership interest um, in your cells. And I see that same argument applying um, in the um, health information context. So, 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 that's, so that's the property argument. Then we have battles between patient privacy and the First Amendment, is the way I think about it. So on one hand, we have um, the, the only privacy case at the constitutional level that the Supreme Court has decided when it comes to health information is Whalen versus Roe um, back in the 70s. And there the court said, well, yeah, you do have a privacy interest in your health information that's protected by the Constitution, and the state can't take that away. But at the end of the day, the state's interest in accessing that information sort of trumps that privacy interest. On the other hand, think about the First Amendment context. I'm thinking about the Sorrell versus IMS health case recently. Um, so in that case, let me, the spoiler is that IMS health, whom we all know and maybe not love, uh, wins, right? And some, and some of them love, you know, absolutely. And, and I actually, and, 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 I've, and I've got to say that I think that uh, I, I'm not necessarily here trying to 
um, you know, sell, though I guess that was a footnote, that was an unnecessarily edit, unnecessary edit that I didn't mean to add. Um, but, but basically, um, so, but, but what the court says there, um, and I disagree with the argument, I think uh, that the, the argument advanced that there was a First Amendment interest, but the case was all about whether um, pharmacy, uh, whether marketing could be done with pharmaceutical data, whether that data could be collected, aggregated, and then used for marketing. And what IMS Health argued, and I think in this case I do not love them, there are many people, individuals in IMS Health whom I really like, and there are some aspects of its work that I do like, but in this case, I think it pushed the envelope, and because of the composition of the Supreme Court it won, it said this is protected by a First Amendment interest, just raw data collection. Now, when we think about the First Amendment, we think about the expression of ideas, right? Such as I am trying to do here, maybe not in too cogent a way. But the court says in that case that simple aggregation and use of data for marketing purposes counts as free speech. So, um, so, so ultimately, you have that balance where the First Amendment interests of um, corporations, as well as their property rights, are beginning to trump, or not even beginning to, but for have some time now, trump the interests of, um, of, of the property interests and the privacy interests of patients. And there are people in this room, such as Frank Pasquale at the back and Nick Terry, who have written about this at some length um, um, you know, for, for quite some time. So what does this mean for the choice between subjective protect protections and objective protections that I laid out earlier? So I think that in this world where we're beginning to see this focus on libertarianism, where this, this anti-regulation, anti-statist approach, uh, the only, the, the politically um, savvy way to go about protecting data is to focus on um, a rhetoric, at least, of individual choice. So the idea that individuals should have a choice over how much their data should be protected. But I'm not saying that there's no place for, um, for, for objective protections. Why is that? Because study upon study in the consumer context, context the contract context, the sociology, law, that they all show that when it comes to reading, reading and comprehending contracts, consumers aren't so good at it, right? So when we talk about informed consent, there's a limit to A, how much consumers can do, and B, to how much consumers want to do. So I think that to the extent we have what I'm calling objective protections, they should be offered as some sort of default, some sort of, you know, what the reasonable person would want in this context, as opposed to, um, and this is all about selling it, right? I'm not talking about, you know, it's, it's optics. But, but, but it should be offered as um, a, a default rule um, that, uh, that a reasonable person would want in this context rather than paternalist government control, right? So, um, so I'm not going to, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm not going to you know, try and um, you know, go into any, any great detail here. Um, but just at a very meta level, what, what form could these protections take? So I think at the beginning, if we're going to be serious about increasing object, uh, subjective control over data, we need to have what uh, the, uh, one of the previous panelists at the plenary called uh, protections that follow the data. Right? So the idea that um, you can detect as the data flows into, you know, um, for uh, new and new environments, right, what Nick has called downstream uh, environments, um, we recognize the appropriate levels of protection that should attach the, to, to the data. And we also allow individuals to, um, to, to, to protect the data in various ways as the data moves to various environments. So this would involve notification that you, know, that, that, that you discussed um, at various points, but individuals should be able to opt for notifications at every step in the process, right? So if it goes to their provider, if the provider passes it on to an exchange, if that exchange passes it on to someone else, right? Um, so, so, so if, and so individuals should have the option of being notified, not afterwards through an accounting of disclosures, but at the time it is happening. And individuals can opt in and opt out at that time. On the other hand, you could also say, well, the individual could say, well, I don't want to, ha want to be notified. I get plenty of email as it is. But here are my privacy preferences. You know, you, 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 let me answer a questionnaire that basically gives, gives you a sense of my privacy preferences. And then the, those preferences can follow the data as the data goes through the ver various, um, you know, various environments. And, um, and, and protections can automatically apply from the outset. And then, of course, um, there can be default rules that I think should protect the data um, depending upon the environment. Now, this is just at a very high level of generality, um, but you know, if you want uh, you know, more detail, then I refer you to the great work that, uh, that the people on my left are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Craig. So uh, 
we have a couple of minutes, and we can uh, open the panel to some questions from the audience. Uh, please. Yeah, um, I, I didn't hear some of you because I, uh, I didn't hear some of what you said, but you're talking about the... The drug, da the drug, the drug d database, um, yeah, boy. Yeah. If somebody wants to go on that first, because yeah. I'll, I'll get all wound up on it. So let me let me rephrase the question that you had in another way. First, I, even if you pay cash, your your records would be there. It doesn't matter. Uh, but the the other question is that I think the general consensus in this room is that the patient privacy, whichever you define privacy, should be protected. Uh, but what if there is a patient that does not want his privacy to be protected? Uh, the way uh, that most of us are thinking about privacy is to limiting access to medical records in any way that we can, but there are many instances where access to those records could help me. One of the instances is the PDMP. Uh, 
it definitely helps the government. It definitely helps public health. And most importantly, it helps patients and their physicians. Uh, so, so as let me, let me say, I mean, when it comes to privacy, I think, first of all, there are patients who would like their medical records to be accessed with people. There are a big majority of patients who really honestly do not care who accesses their medical records, especially when that person who accesses your records is not in the close circle of the friends and family that you know. So I may be concerned about the vaccination records of my, of my children because I want to know about them, but I'm not concerned about the vaccination records of my neighbor or somebody else who happens to be living in DC or in the United States. So I, I think uh, sometimes tr uh, we, should, we should pause a second and think about uh, who is accessing what type of records and why we should care. I can understand that I do not want my medical records to be accessible to anybody. There are some things that I may not like my boss to know about my health records. And I think it's against the law if he goes against his way to, to access my records. But I really do not care that somebody who even doesn't know me knows what is going on in my medical records. I, 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 I wanted to jump in. I do want to respond to the opioid. And what I'll say is that the, I think that that is a really good example of what we're talking about uh, saying, what is the use what is the benefit of it? Because what we know is that, it's an issue I've been involved in for about 20 years. What we know is that states like Kentucky that, had, that have had the database have not had better success at eliminating the abuse. So the database has not necessarily, or the triplicate forms, all the different things that they've done on that. So it's a question of what is it, is it doing what it's supposed to do. And I can tell you, having spent 20 years now um, working in DC, it's, that was one that is much more to look like they're doing something than to actually do something. What I'd like to say too about what you're just talking about is we have a profoundly schizophrenic approach to uh, our, our attitude on privacy in this country. Because what I hear from every, pa from every patient that comes in a doctor's office is they complain about filling out the same damn forms every single time, but they want to protect their privacy, but they worry about it being in a database, but they want to protect their privacy, and back and forth we go. That's why I was very candid with you about my attitude about about the e-care because I almost feel guilty for liking it. But we that's one of the big problems that we have. You don't care, some people care. Some people care until it's inconvenient. What do we do? Yeah. I think it goes. So, let, let's, just, let's get some more questions, yeah, actually, I, because I think that Please, go ahead. Um, it, I think what you were talking about, we have to frame it as choice. Um, we don't have choice. And Randy, if I understand your system, you opt into the HIE or you opt out. Mm -hmm. But you don't have a choice of Dr. X gets this information and Dr. Y gets that information. And that is critical. Um, I work with folks with mental health challenges. There is evidence out the wazoo that doctors give inferior physical health care to people who have a psychiatric diagnosis in their records. Mm -hmm. Now, the doctor having more information doesn't result in better quality health care for those people. It results in worse, or it can result in worse mm -hmm. health care. So the idea that giving people the dignity of the risk to say, I'm either going to risk not giving my doctor uh, the information or I am going to risk giving my mm -hmm. doctor the information mm -hmm. is critical. And from what I understand, 
Zibdi. Zibdi. Diagnosis, medications, evaluations, etc. And the private, you, the private does allow the granularity. Randy. It does? Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to go ahead and, and address because I, I think there's some gaps here that I can help fill. In terms of our network uh, being a public HIE, there are certain uh, lab results, tests, which are uh, require ha a heavier level of security that do not allow us to. Um, transmit or make searchable on our network. Uh, behavior health, uh, reproductive health, uh, uh, those are a couple of, of, uh, of the tests that are not accessible through our network. Um, and all patients do have the opportunity to opt out of being searchable. By law, a doctor determines how they want to receive the results. If the doctor uh, wants to receive the results through DEN, I mean, that's, that's the doctor's preference in providing the care, and, and they've earned the right as a licensed medical professional to make that determination. If the, if the patient doesn't think that that's the way that they want them to receive the results, they may find another doctor that thinks differently. Um, but ultimately, the patient can opt out of being searchable in our network, and, and therefore, would, if they go to the emergency room, they would not uh, allow the, the uh, care team in the emergency room to get the background uh, that would be available on our network, but that's their free choice to go ahead and do that. So just uh, we can ask questions after the panel finishes because this we are, we are already out of time, but just to summarize, I think the best way to define privacy is, uh, I, I heard you say, the, uh, you know, uh, honor the dignity of patients and let them have a choice of who uh, is going to have access to the records and who is not. So I think uh, having a, a paternalistic approach and saying that patients don't know, so we are going to decide for them that nobody is going to have access to their records is as bad as saying that patients don't know, so <laughs> let's give them access to everybody. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.